really what you need is like you need to build a life that doesn't require escaping, right? If you have this life that's unsustainable and you keep putting yourself back in that position where you need relief, right? Like you got to get away, you got to escape. That's not going to work, right? Like you you have to reestablish some amount of balance. You need to build a life that actually fits for you and aligns with what's important to you. Any of these these tools and techniques, right? Like they're not a substitute for actually building that life for yourself. Well, welcome to the show, Ben. It's so great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Johnny and I were sharing a little bit before the show how many of our clients seem to be overwhelmed with worry. I think worry is on the rise across the world, it feels like. But many of us don't really have a great understanding of where that worry comes from, what it actually is behind it. So I'd love to just jump in and first break down, well, what is worry? <laughs> and when should we be worried about worrying? Yeah. So what I usually tell people is that worry is a problem when it's a problem, right? So if it's showing up for you in a way that's distressing, it's causing some impairment for you, it's getting in the way of living your life, it's taking a bunch of time away from you. For me, that's when it's a problem, right? And so I, I, that's not to say that there's some objective measure of that. You know, if you've spent more than two hours each day worrying, that's when it's a problem. You know, it's really subjective. It's about what it looks like for you in your life and where you draw that line and saying, hey, this is acceptable or this is unacceptable. Worry itself is this sort of universal experience. Every single human being has moments where worry shows up, where we have we have things that we care about, stuff that matters to us, and it's going to show up in our minds. We're going to notice it. We're going to notice the potential that something could go wrong. We could lose that thing that we really care about. I think this is a good thing to have stuff that we care about. But yeah, I think we have to figure out how we navigate that in life and having this stuff that could go wrong and figuring out how to kind of relate to that and make sense of it. Now, it seems that certain people just tend to naturally worry more than others. Is there any science behind why some people are more predisposed to worry? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think worry is sort of a part of a number of different conditions, right? So we have things like phobias, we have OCD, we have generalized anxiety disorder, we have panic disorder, right? There are all these different categories of mental health conditions that often involve anxiety in one form or another. And all of them include worry. It's this sort of transdiagnostic phenomenon. And I, I think the, the thing that's a little harder to make sense of is so like each one of these conditions has its own sort of unique proprietary blend of genetic conditions and environmental factors. And, you know, there's a bunch of different stuff that goes into why does worry show up for this person or why does this kind of constellation of symptoms show up for this, this individual person. But yeah, I mean, I, I think the sort of short answer is that like many mental health problems, it, it is a combination of a bunch of stuff. And so, yeah, I think that's genetics. It's these experiences that we've had. It's the way that we were raised. And, you know, th there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So, yeah, I think it's a little hard to break it down into just one thing or another. It's usually sort of a unique interaction of a bunch of different factors. And recognizing that there's a lot of factors behind it. And, of course, hearing some of the ways that worry can manifest that are terrible for us, probably mental health issues that none of us want. Can we actually control worry? Is this something that we have control over? Yeah. So yes and no. And I, I think we, we have to be really intentional about trying to control the parts of it that we can control, but also accepting the parts of it that we can't. And so I make a big distinction between worry, the noun, and worrying, the verb. So worry this experience where we just have a thought pop up in our minds. I am concerned about something. I have a what if thought, you know, what if something bad happens? That part we don't control. Thoughts just show up in our mind, unwanted, unintentional, automatic, right? Like we don't have any control over that part of it. But what we do in that moment, we, we do have some say over that. And I think that idea that, hey, these worries will show up, but whether we choose to engage in worrying, that's a different question. And so I, I think that for me, that's where the action takes place. It's figuring out, hey, how do I navigate life as a person where worries show up? And now I have to 
kind of disengage from that, or I have to figure out some way to respond to that, that will be helpful and won't result in me just kind of churning through these thoughts incessantly. So yeah, worry happens. Worrying is up to us to some degree. I guess the big question is then for our listeners who tend to be highly analytical in those types of jobs, programming, engineers, these are numbers folks, they're building things. So they spend a lot of time in their, in their head, which predisposes them to overthinking and rumination. So where do we draw the line? How can they dis- differentiate between the two? Yeah, I, I think it's an excellent question. And I, I think it's really important. The example that I give to people a lot is, you know, let's say you have a test coming up on Friday. You have a big, big math test, or if you're working, you know, you have a big project due on Friday and you have a choice. You can either spend this week worrying about that test or studying for that test. I think we could all agree. Studying is probably going to be more effective. If you spend that whole week worrying, you're going to get really anxious. You're going to work yourself up. And you will not fare any better at that. If anything, you're going to do worse on that test, right? That that's not actually going to move the bar at all. That it's distinct from studying, right? So I I think we want to be clear about where is this behavior effective? Where is it actually doing something? Where is it functional? And where is it just kind of churning? And so I, I appreciate that. Hey, we all need to do some analysis. We all need to do some anticipating of what's going to come next, right? Like that, this stuff can be really, really helpful. But I, I think we have to take a step back and look at what we're doing and ask that question of, hey, is this actually moving things forward or am I just spinning? Um, and I think there are a lot of questions out here where I think one of my favorite questions to ask people is kind of like, hey, is this a problem that can be solved in your head? Or do you actually need to do something? Is there an action item? And so I'm always curious, hey, what's the action item? If you're trying to make a decision, okay, make a pros and cons list. Sure, analyze it, assess the, the, the costs, the benefits, look at all these angles. But at the end of it, you need to pull the trigger on making a decision. You can't just spin and churn through these things over and over again. So I, I think we really want to be asking that question, hey, where is this functional? Where is it helpful? Versus where is it just kind of this exercise in futility where we're spinning, but we're not moving forward. And I think it, it really is that kind of that point of diminishing returns where it's just, it's not yielding any benefit anymore. Yeah. And it, it seems to me like there's worry around things that you can control and impact. And then there's worry around things that you have no control over. And oftentimes, if that worry leads to you taking actions that improve things that you can control, well, then you start to feel, hey, it is good that I'm worried about the right things. Worry has been helpful in my life. But if we're worried about, does the teacher like me for that test that I was studying for? And are they going to grade me differently because they dislike me? Something that's completely out of our control. Well, that's not going to be very beneficial. It's probably going to rob you of the hours you need to be spending studying. Absolutely. And I think that's a super important distinction, you know, that I I think when you have a problem that can be solved, then yeah, by all means, solve it. (laughs) Go for it. Yeah. Find find that action, action item, figure out what you can do. But when it's an unsolvable problem, yet this is now an exercise in futility. And I think we, we, in those moments, we need to pivot towards just acceptance. We, we cannot know the answer and that's it. We need to move on. I like the concept of a relationship you have with worry and you discuss this in the book. And I think a lot of us have experiences culturally, you know, there are even tropes around certain cultures, people worry more than others. We have the experience we had from our childhood around our family's disposition to worry. And then we have experiences ourselves where worrying helped us or hurt us and all of these th- factors combine to develop our own relationship with worry. And I think it's important to just recognize, hey, I have a relationship with this thing that's happening, this process that we're all feeling. And maybe that relationship is unhealthy in ways that I'd like to impact, or maybe it is healthy. And the worry that I have had in the past has served me well, and I don't spend a lot of time ruminating or in inaction in areas that I should be taking action. So I have a healthy relationship with worry. So can you unpack this concept of our relationship with worry and and how you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're spot on there in saying that we need to step back and look at this stuff. And I think sometimes we we assume that the way we relate to worry, these beliefs that we have about it, the approach that we have to it, that this is just 
how it is, you know, that I, I am how I am. This is it, right? Like, this is how my mind works. This is what I do. And that's all there is to it. And I think the reality is like, well, sure, maybe some of these things are automatic, right? Like, it may be that they're habitual. It may be that they happen without you really thinking about it. But that doesn't mean you can't start thinking about it and doing it more intentionally. And so I, I always think about like, well, all right, if I, I put on my left pant leg first every morning, I do it without thinking. It's just what I do. That doesn't mean it's impossible for me to put my right pant leg on first. It just means I'm going to have to be a little bit more deliberate about that. I might need to make myself a note or stuff a sock in the left pant leg. You know, that I, I might need to do some really deliberate, intentional things to kind of shift that habit a bit, but it absolutely can be done. And I think this is also true of these beliefs that we have about worry, the way that we relate to it. And so I, I think the, the ones that I see a lot are folks who have a belief about worry, that it's something that they should be able to control and that essentially like that this is just bad, right? Like you should not be worrying. You should be able to stop this. And I think what, what I like to try to move people towards is a relationship to worry where we're saying, hey, this is, it's okay if this shows up, you know, this, this initial thought of, hey, I'm concerned about something, I care about something, that's all good, right? Like, it's okay if you have worries. We're trying to just develop this approach to it where it's not taking over, where it's not lapsing into something that's unhelpful. And I think even sometimes as a therapist, I I spend a lot of time trying to help people with really negative beliefs and try to kind of get to a more positive or at least at least neutral kind of place with it. But I think worry is the one place where where I'm actually targeting some of the positive beliefs where where pe when people are telling me, "Hey, like worry is is helping me to do well on that test. It's helping me to perform. Wor worry is what I need in order to succeed in life." And, and this is a place where I'm usually saying like, no, I, actually, that's not worry. You know, you succeeded at that thing because you worked at it or you, you did something here. You used problem solving or you, you, you actually implemented some skill. Some, there was something concrete there. That's the thing that allowed you to do well. It wasn't worrying. It's like that test example. Worrying isn't the thing that helps you to do well on the test. It's the preparation. It's studying. It's going to class every week, right? Like it, it's doing all these things that actually contribute to your success. But it's not just incessantly turning things over in your head. That's not the thing that's helpful. That sounds exactly like another problem that our listeners like to forge a good relationship around, such as perfectionism, by wielding it and using it as a badge of honor and tying it to their identity. Well, now they have permission to be a perfectionist and to drive yeah. themselves nuts. Now they have permission to worry and ruminate and drive themselves nuts. And if that's the relationship you have, it's going to be very difficult to change that because it's now tied to your identity. Absolutely. Well, I, I also think with perfectionism and, and worrying, right? Like that we miss this opportunity to learn how to do something different, right? So let's, let's say I have that test on Friday. I study for 10 hours and I get an A. What I'm going to say is, yeah, I got an A. This is awesome. I got an A because I studied for 10 hours. But what I don't get to see is what would have happened if I studied for nine hours or eight hours or five hours or not at all, right? Like it is entirely possible. I could get that A studying for 20 minutes, right? But if, if we always say, oh, you got to study for 10 hours and that's how you get the A, we never get an opportunity to see what happens when we do a little bit less. And I think this happens all the time with worrying that someone worries all week about something, that thing goes well, and they say, oh yeah, it's because of the worrying. And it's like, no, 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 like it's not. That's not actually the thing. That's not the active ingredient. That's not the thing that made it go well. It's something else. And so, yeah, I think when we always do more, when we we always strive for perfection, when we always worry and as a way of kind of quote unquote preparing, we really miss out on this opportunity to test out what would happen when we do less. And a lot of the time we can do just as well doing a little bit less. So it sounds like part of this relationship with worry is not attributing a positive or a negative trait to it, but instead recognizing and accepting that worry is present. It's natural and normal for everyone. But there are much better things to be dedicating your time and energy to towards the tasks at hand, the goals that you have, the values that really matter to you in your life. 
and recognizing when that relationship might be on the negative side or the positive side to justify behaviors, compulsions that don't actually help you. Absolutely. I think this is just kind of how I, I like to think about any of these kind of symptoms that that I see, right? Like someone says, I'm angry or I'm doing too much of this or too little of that, or these things are not just inherently good or bad, right? Like it, it depends on how they fit in people's lives. Are they getting in the way? Are they interfering? And so, yeah, I think worrying, I would make the argument that I think worrying, the verb, is generally unhelpful. I, I think problem solving can be really helpful. I think having the experience of worry, caring about something, noticing an unwanted thought, these things are all fine. But that behavior of worrying is usually sort of, uh, it's not adding anything, right? Like there, there's no value added by going over something again. And again, I, I appreciate there are places where you want to double check. That's okay. We, we want to make sure that we're doing that in a way that makes sense and still fits in our lives. And once it starts to sort of deviate from that, that's not helpful anymore. So yeah, I think it's this kind of contextual assessment of it. You know, does it fit in your life? Does it align with how you want to be showing up and how you want to be spending your time? So if you've recognized that there's a pattern to worry that has created an unhealthy relationship with it, where you're spending too much time worrying, worrying is dominating your life in ways that keep you from your goals and the things that really matter to you, what can we start to do, recognize that we can't control it, <laughs> worry will be there, but to build a better relationship with worry so we don't spend as much time worrying? So I think this is where I think everyone needs to do a little assessment of themselves, right? You know, so I, I, as we had talked about before, worrying is a thing that shows up in a lot of different ways. It's driven by a lot of different things. And I think everyone needs to kind of step back and look at their own sort of collection of things that contribute to worry. So if that is hey, I have a lot of beliefs about worry, or if that is I get really immersed in my thoughts and I don't even notice that I'm worrying, or maybe it's, I again, I have these beliefs that it's really helpful for me and I should be worrying. So, you know, everyone has to kind of step back and say like, hey, what's driving my worry, right? Like, how did I get to be in this position? And then I think we need to tailor our interventions accordingly, right? So depending on what that thing is that's driving your worry, you want to step back and figure out, okay, what, what's the intervention? What do I do to kind of reshape this a bit? And I think a lot of that starts, at least for most people, starts with trying to cultivate some awareness of this. And I think where I get a lot of pushback is people saying, hey, I, again, this is, it's automatic. This is just a thing that I do. I didn't choose to start worrying. It just happens. And I believe that. I think that's, that's true, that it, it does become automatic for people. But I think what that means is you have to start getting really intentional and really aware of where this is showing up. So that might be noticing, hey, I start worrying a lot when I'm driving home from work, or I, I do it a lot when I'm laying in bed trying to go to sleep, right? Like that you have to kind of take some inventory of where this is showing up in your life. And what I would encourage people to do is in, in those moments, really get a feel for it, right? So it's not just like, oh, I'm, I'm in my car driving home. But I, I think we want to flesh that out a little bit and say, like, all right, I'm in my car driving home. What's going on for me in that moment? You know, am I tired because it's the end of the day and I'm kind of running on fumes? Am I pissed off because my boss was being a jerk or something was unfair? Am I just bored? There's nothing to do and my mind just starts going, right? Like, and so I think we really want to take some inventory of what's going on so we can start to notice, hey, what's what's contributing? And again, what what can I do to then shift that in a different direction. Um, so I, I think we always have to start with some amount of mindfulness, essentially, right? Like that I think it's just taking a moment to step back and sort of observe that experience so we can really get a feel for it. And then again, from there, I think we want to figure out what that intervention is. So, you know, if it is I'm bored, then yeah, we got to find some other stuff to do on that car ride. And maybe there's a cool podcast you, you can listen to, or, you know, you got to find something to kind of take that space. I think there's also a level of that needs to be reached as well and building a worldview of having an understanding of who you are, what your intent is, what your goals are. Those are the questions that take away the black box that is sitting in front of you. And if you don't have answers to those, well, of course, your mind is going to wander. And the more you continue to pile on superficial, passive, mind-numbing 
things to do to take your mind off yourself, those questions only that can gets kicked down the road. So that worry continues to linger. So anytime that there is a dull moment in your life, well, those questions will be piercing through because they need to be answered. Absolutely. I think a lot of these things come back to, hey, you have to build this life that's aligned with what's important to you, what's meaningful, right? Like that if you are continuing to try to, yeah, numb out to these things that are painful or to kind of distract from something that's upsetting, right? Like if, using that the car example, like, hey, if I'm mad because my boss is a jerk, there's only so much I can do to kind of disengage from those thoughts. At some point, I probably need a different job, right? Like I, I need to build this life that actually fits for me. I had this conversation a lot around this idea of kind of self-care. You know, I think a lot of people think of that as like, oh yeah, you got to, you know, I don't know, go go get a massage or go take a vacation. Or, But I think really what you need is like, you need to build a life that doesn't require escaping, right? That it, if you have this life that's unsustainable and you keep putting yourself back in that position where you you need relief, right? Like you got to get away, you got to escape. That's not going to work, right? Like you you have to reestablish some some amount of balance. You need to build a life that actually fits for you and aligns with what's important to you. And yeah, I, I think any of these these tools and techniques, right? Like they're not a substitute for actually building that life for yourself. So recognizing the awareness piece to start it seems like there's a, a few different areas to explore around that awareness. So there's environment. You brought up being in your car, driving home after work. There's specific people in your relationships with those people. For some, our boss causes more worry. I know for me, my mom causes more worry. So there's conversations or relationships that will evoke. There's environments that will evoke. Then there's past experiences or trauma that will evoke it. But starting at first, just to recognize, okay, worry is coming up and let me kind of sleuth what's, what's behind this worry and are there patterns to this worrying that is coming up again and again, where I'm hungry after work, I had a big meeting with my boss that I knew wasn't going to go well and now I'm going to ruminate the whole ride home. You start to see the patterns to, oh, this worrying is popping up repeatedly in these areas. What do we do with that awareness? Because I feel like that's the one thing that typically is a pretty easy step for many of us of like, oh, my mom causes me to worry or, oh, yeah, I'm always worrying when I have a big project due. But what we actually do with that awareness, I think, is a, a key step that we need to unpack for our audience. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and I think a place where people get stuck a lot, right? It's so like I think, as you point out, like just being aware that's the jumping off point, right? Like you, you need that. It's a prerequisite. If you're going to have any intervention, you have to be aware. But then, yeah, you need to pivot somewhere. You need to do something. I think there are a lot of different approaches to this. And again, there's, there's no correct answer to it. I think you have to find what works for you. But, you know, I, I think to one degree or another, it's going to involve these strategies to kind of disengage from it, right? So like you're feeling that pull to figure something out to solve this problem, right? Like something is pulling you inward to turn it over in your head. And your job is to figure out, okay, like how do I refocus that attention elsewhere? Could be outward into a task that you're doing. It could be, you know, a thing that I sometimes recommend that people do is to just get like even the step of getting really concrete around what you need to do. So AJ, you had mentioned like this idea that, hey, some of these these worries have solutions. There's something you can do. Some don't. Some some of these things just don't have answers. You know, that, hey, I want to know how this thing is going to go next week. It's like, well, you don't get to know until next week, right? Like that. That's it. You know, there, there's no way around that. And I think sometimes these these bigger life questions. You know, did I choose the right career? Did I choose the right partner? What's the meaning of life? You know, there, there's some big existential stuff that we just don't get to have concrete answers to. And so I, I think one thing that a lot of people kind of miss is that these kinds of questions, if you just keep them in your head, you can spin around forever, right? Like you can puzzle over it. You can look at every angle. It, you, you'll never get to an answer. But when we say those things out loud, you know, and I, I sometimes will have people do this exercise that 
It's a little embarrassing, but I, I kind of like it. So one a really classic sort of intervention for worrying is to do this thing called kind of worry time. So during the day, you notice that desire to worry. And what you do is you jot down the thing, you know, oh, I'm worried about my finances and you jot it down. And then you schedule this worry time for the evening where, you know, in the moment you say, okay, I'm not going to worry, but I have my worry time. It's going to be seven o'clock tonight. I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to carve out 20 minutes to worry. And that's fine. You know, I, it's, it's an intervention that a lot of people use. A lot of people like it. It's always felt a little weird to me, that this idea that, A, that it's that easy to just delay it and kind of forget about it. it sometimes it is. But then B, like, I've always said, like, well, if we're trying not to worry, why are we scheduling time to worry? That, that Something about that doesn't quite feel right to me. But so here's the tweak that I like for that one, which is, okay, you know, jot this thing down. You have it at the end of the day. But if we're going to spend time worrying, what I want people to do is stand in front of a mirror and say it out loud. And the reason for that is every single person, when they do that, they immediately recognize how preposterous these worries are, right? Like how much of a waste of time it is to be trying to solve these unsolvable problems. And I think just that very act of saying it out loud, because now it kind of hits differently. These things that we turn over in our head things can get pretty wild in there, right? Like we, a lot of us will let, let these absolutely insane things bounce around in our head. But the second we say it out loud, now all of a sudden we have this check with reality. It just, it hits different when, when, when we start to enter these things into the real world and, and our surroundings. So I think sometimes looking at ourselves in the mirror, saying it out loud, all of a sudden we're going to have a really different reaction to that. And I, I think for a lot of people, it does become a lot easier to say like, all right, I gotta, I gotta move on. That's not, that's not worth my time. So that scheduling it out and then following through with the worry, the step in your mind of actually verbalizing it to yourself in the mirror makes it quite striking to recognize, okay, some of these things that I are bouncing around in my head don't actually mean anything now that I've shared it. And I certainly wouldn't share it with anyone else. <laughs> like I'm embarrassed that I'm even sharing it here in my bathroom. For sure. And I think even a simplified version of that is just, again, saying it out loud or writing it down, this just kind of acceptance. You know, I, I think saying, writing down that sentence, I can't have an answer to this. There is no answer. I'm not going to figure it out, right? Like that, again, I think we, there's a part of us that kind of knows this, but I, I think when we make it official in that way, by saying it out loud, writing it down, again, it just kind of hits differently. And I, I think it often gives people that little, I don't know, something solid to be able to kind of move forward and accept. What I enjoyed about the book, and I recognize that no one thing is a silver bullet for everyone. It's a collection of tools and practices that might work for you in some scenarios, might work all the time. Very similar to, to our curriculum and, and what we train our clients on is recognizing all these great tools that you have at your disposal. And, and sometimes they're the perfect tool for the job. Sometimes it's a combination of tools. So Let's keep going around this awareness. Once we've recognized and brought awareness to it, what are some other things we can do to start to reorient ourselves and break that worrying rabbit hole that we can put ourselves in? Yeah. As you mentioned, right? Like these, they're all, you need a toolbox, right? There's, there's no one thing that's going to be the answer. I think another important component of this is attention. And so when people are worrying, they're turning their attention to this a doubt or a concern, right? Like that there's this turning attention inward. And I think what a lot of people struggle with is this idea of sort of flexible attention, right? So like being able to direct our attention where we want it, when we want it. And at the end of the day, that is, it's a muscle, right? Like it's a thing that we have to build and practice. And that ability to kind of wield our attention and put it wherever we want to put it it's a thing that we have to work at. And so I think a lot of people, again, just assume, hey, I'm, I'm not good at this. I'm never going to be good at it. That's just how it is. My, I get immersed in my thoughts. They kind of commandeer my attention and that's all there is to it. And again, I think it's, we have to sort of accept that, no, this is something you have to work at and you have to practice. And so this, this is something that I will often encourage people to do is to say, okay, you have to carve out some time to practice building that attention muscle if you want to have any hope at doing it in the moment where this stuff is coming up. And I think this is sort of one of those universal truths of any of these interventions that if you only try to do it in the moment where things are really hard, they're really charged, you're feeling really anxious, you're feeling really mad, it's not going to go very well, right? Like you, you have to get that practice in, 
in times where it's a little bit easier. It's a little more of just a, an easy layup and, and, and you can build that muscle so that in the moment when you need it, it's a little easier to kind of access that. So that attention building, there are a bunch of different ways that, that we can do this. And, you know, for folks who want to kind of dig into that, you can just Google attention training techniques. There's lots of stuff out there. But what I usually try to have people do is to just kind of practice pivoting. So I always think about attention as sort of this spotlight, right? So that we we all have awareness. And this is sort of this broadest layer that, you know, awareness is, I always think of it like a, the f- floodlights up or, you know, the stadium lights go up. You can see everything. Everything is illuminated. And that's awareness, right? That in this moment, we are aware of lots and lots of different things. In an ideal world, we are putting our attention on just this one sliver of it. So right now, the three of us, we're paying attention to each other. We're focused on this conversation. But the reality is our awareness is much broader, you know, that we might have some awareness of how we're feeling, how awake we are. Are we hungry? What's going to happen later today, right? There's all sorts of stuff swirling around. And our job is just to narrow that focus, you know, to, to use sort of the spotlight rather than the floodlights. And so in order to do that, we have to kind of practice. And so what that looks like is I, I will say, okay, we are going to first practice this sort of open awareness. So notice all the things pinging around. Notice the sounds of the traffic outside. Notice the feeling of, you know, your feet on the floor, the feeling in your seat. Are you hungry? Notice everything, everything that's just popping up. And so in that moment, we're not trying to control it. We're not trying to corral it into anything. It's just that open awareness. And then we want to pivot. And so I I think that pivoting to, okay, now we're going to put our attention on one specific thing and we're going to keep it there. And in that, in, in that moment where we're just putting our attention on that thing, again, could be a physical sensation, could be something we notice in the room, could be anything, but we're, we're going to put our attention there and you're going to notice your attention getting pulled away. You're going to hear some other thing. You're going to notice some other thing. Some thoughts going to pop up. And we just want to kind of gently shift our attention back to that one thing. And then there's a third thing that I have people do, which is then to pivot that around, you know, to bounce around. So, okay, notice notice this feeling, notice that thing, right? Like move it around and kind of keep it there. And so I, I always think of it, uh, the name I, I give it is sort of a burpees for your brain, right? Like that we're, we're moving from one thing to the next and it's that open awareness, it's that really selective attention and then it's that moving the spotlight around to a few different things. And we just want to practice this. You know, it's that attention muscle that we're flexing and there are these different versions of it. And I, I think as we practice these skills, we build the muscle, we get better and better at it. And I think if we do this over time, then in those moments where we're really struggling with it, we're going to have a little bit better ability to kind of use that attention muscle in the way that we need to. So I just want to kind of underscore this. It takes practice. This is not a thing that you do one time and then you're you're really good at it. You're going to have to do it over and over again. But again, I, I think if you are someone who gets immersed in those thoughts where where thoughts show up and you are just at the mercy of those thoughts, your mind goes inward and you're in it, figuring it out, then you probably need to strengthen that attention muscle and figure out how you can have a better kind of sense of control over it. Certainly that all of these skills need to be developed. And here's another one that I'm sure our listeners are asking about. So if they are analytical, they're in their heads a lot, we're now focusing on the problem so they can actively work on it. How do they develop the good enough threshold when their brains are naturally seeking absolute certainty? Mm, yeah, it's a hard one. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that experience, that kind of intolerance of uncertainty, everyone experiences this a little bit differently, right? That, so that threshold, you know, I think for a lot of people, we're going to say, hey, 99%, that's good enough, right? Like, we're, we're going to call that, we're okay, it's good, that's a yes, right? Like, that, that, that's good enough. For some people, it's never enough, right? Like, that, that, that little sliver, no matter how unlikely, it's enough to kind of get you going. And I, I, think, I think you see this a lot with things like OCD and anxiety, you know, that, all right, I, I've checked that lock once, I've checked it twice, I've checked it 10 times, it's really unlikely that it's unlocked, but we can't rule it out, right? Like that there's still that little sliver of possibility. And for some people, that's enough to kind of keep you going. You know, I think it takes a lot of practice. And so I I think the kind of behavioral reinforcers here, I think are really important. So thinking about something like OCD, where 
essentially what we would do there is we'd say, all right, well, we have to practice not checking that lock. And as you do that, as, as you get accustomed to that experience where you, you don't check it, or maybe you check it once and, and you walk away, at first, that's going to feel really intolerable. It's going to be really anxiety provoking. But as you practice that and do it a bunch, eventually that's going to feel good enough. And so I, I think that idea of intolerance of uncertainty, that it's another one of these things that we actually can get better at and improve at, but it, it takes this really conscious effort to kind of retrain ourselves in whatever the thing is. You don't have to like it. I think that's a, an important point here. So like, I, I would love to know that I'm going to live a long, healthy life. My kids are going to be happy and also live long, healthy life. Like, I would love to know all that stuff. And the fact that I can't know these things is uncomfortable. And I don't think there will ever be a world where that's not uncomfortable, right? I think this is, not to be too bleak about it, but life is kind of painful sometimes. There's some hard stuff. There are some things we can't know. And we have to learn to be okay with that. And again, acceptance, being okay with it, that doesn't mean we like it. It just means we accept that there's not an alternative, right? And so I, I, when I think about acceptance, it, like using that example, what would it even look like for me to say, hey, I don't accept that I can't know that my kids will be okay, right? Like, what, what, what does that even mean, right? Like, we have to. There, there, there's no other option. And again, we can be mad about it. We can, it can make us feel uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, these things that we can't know, we can't know. And, and so I, I think practicing that acceptance, I, I think in some ways it's a thing that gets easier and it's a thing that we can learn to live with. But I think there probably will always be some kernel of, hey, this doesn't feel great, but I'm fresh out of other options. <laughs> you know, that if I have to accept, I have to accept. Reality is what it is. And I think it's important to point out that there are external factors that are driving this uncertainty and also trying to hijack our focus. <laughs> and I think that is another reason to empower you to look to exert more self-control over your attention instead of letting the devices and the notifications and the pseudo productivity and all those external forces hijack it. Because we've seen now that these companies have built entire industries off of your attention. It's the most precious resource in the world. So you practicing and developing a skill set to strengthen your ability to focus when need be and allow yourself to take off focus when need be is a really powerful skill towards success, towards creating great relationships, fulfillment, and ultimately living a life in line with your values. So it is something worth pursuing and recognizing that well, there's marketing forces that are creating fear and uncertainty and doubt <laughs> like never before. In every device, every screen that we encounter, they're hijacking these systems to take advantage of us. So it is on you to strengthen them. It's important to strengthen them. And when you do, you actually do develop a better relationship with yourself, a better relationship with worry, and also a better relationship with others. Because what I've found, and, and I feel quite fortunate that I don't spend a lot of time in worry, I actually attract a lot of people into my life. They find a lot of comfort in being around me when I'm not in that panicked, worried state. And right now, you might not recognize that you have such a bad relationship with worry that you're actually pushing away other relationships with people because you're not managing your worry in a healthy manner. And it makes it hard to be a partner. It makes it hard to go into business with you. It makes it hard to be on your team when worry has hijacked your attention, it's created more uncertainty and doubt in your life, and it's created an obstacle <laughs> to the goals that really matter to you. So I know we're saying, hey, these are tools and you need to practice them, but I just want to highlight the value there is in practicing these. Because I know when we talk about a lot of the soft skills on the show and the mindset stuff, we have a lot of listeners who will spend hours at the gym and will fine tune their diet and every calorie that goes in their body but then they don't often think about these other areas where if they put in some practice and some effort around controlling their focus and their attention and recognizing the difference between uncertainty and doubt and using that to their advantage to manage worry, man, it unlocks a whole other side of things that makes life exciting, invigorating, and draws people in to your life. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And I want to I wanna highlight something here that I think would really help our, our listeners, and that's recognizing that maybe you're not a worrier, but we all have people in our life that we care about who, who do worry. 
So how do we approach those relationships with people that we actually want to be a great partner for? We want to be a great friend. We want to help our family member who's in this worry trap. What advice do you have for those who are trying to manage other people's worry? And I know the cliche, don't worry about it. We know how terrible that feels when you're in that worrying spiral. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we're, what most people are tempted to do, and I think what comes naturally to a lot of people, is to kind of reassure other people. You know, say, oh, yeah, you, you, like you said, you don't have to worry about that. Everything's going to be okay. And it usually falls flat because the reality is we can't know. I don't know that everything's going to be okay, right? I don't, I don't have that ability to promise everything's going to work out. And so, yeah, I think there's something not quite genuine about that response where we reassure people in those moments. And I, I think what usually goes better with most things is to kind of validate. And we're not validating, hey, that you should be worried about this thing. We're really just validating, hey, it's hard to feel worried, right? You care about this thing a lot. You want it to work out. That's awesome, right? Like, it's great to have passion about things. It's great to care about them. I see how much that matters to you. I see that you care a lot it's hard not to know. And so, yeah, I think we want to kind of validate and really ultimately give people this confidence to get through that. And I, I think that when we reassure or when we start worrying and kind of falling into that trap, I think we're missing this opportunity to learn that we're actually capable of being uncertain. We're capable of getting through it without doing these things. And so, yeah, I think whether it's you or you're doing this for a loved one or a friend or whoever, I, I think really just instilling that confidence of, hey, like you can get through this thing, right? That it's it, it's hard, it's uncomfortable, but you are capable of having that experience without having to escape from it or having to make it all right or having to get these sort of false promises that everything's going to be okay, right? Like you don't need that. And so, yeah, I think it is important that we don't, just try to make the bad feelings go away or we don't try to just give someone this false sense of certainty, but instead, yeah, we kind of accompany them and let them feel something uncomfortable and let that be all right for a little while. Yeah. I, I actually enjoyed the phrase, let's worry about that together and allow them to express some of those worries because much like you are sharing in that exercise with the mirror, you know, once we get these worries out of our head and we have someone who's who's really going to genuinely listen and, and not just saying that dismissively, it does bring about a sense of peace of, hey, I, I verbalized some of these worries. Wow. And sharing that with my partner or my best friend, I realized, well, that was really silly. I've done a lot of training in this area or I've had a lot of situations like this in the past that it did go well. So it's unfounded. Or it might just recognize a pattern for you of like, oh, hey, actually, when I'm in these situations or this environment, it causes a lot of that. So let me replace that. Let me change that. Let me put on the podcast. Let me go for a walk and get out of this office that's really cramped. It doesn't get a lot of natural light and allow myself that opportunity to get to that choice point, as you were saying, to recognize the worry, not let it override our system and work to a place that we can move our focus and attention towards action that doesn't allow us to ruminate. So I'm curious in putting together the book and and working through your own worries, is there any one tool that that you discovered that was a huge unlock for you personally? I concur with what you said. I, I am fortunate in that I, I don't tend to not get too stuck in these things. But I think, and, and maybe this is just knowing myself and what what the kinds of things that work for me. So I'm pretty stubborn and a little obstinate about things. And so like I know what's helpful for me is knowing this kind of system of reinforcement, knowing, okay, so like if I worry about this thing, I am unintentionally going to perpetuate this cycle where I, I need to worry in order to make things better and right like that I'm I'm kind of feeding my brain all the wrong information that this is this helpful thing, right? So I, I know that that's not <laughs> what's helpful. And so I, I think just that uh, desire to, kind of dig in and make sure that I'm not shooting myself in the foot here, right? And so I, w with that cycle, I always think about this idea of like, kind of like algorithms, right? So like if you go on uh, whatever, Facebook or Instagram, and you see an ad for, I don't know, shoes, and you click on the ad, you're going to get more ads for shoes, obviously, right? Like that, that's what happens, right? The algorithm learns what you like, what you think is important, what's interesting, and it feeds you more of it. But our brains are doing the exact same thing, right? So when we engage with worrying, we pay attention to it, 
our brain is saying, hey, this is interesting, it's necessary, it's keeping you safe, it's helpful, right? Like you're feeding it all of this positive information and it's gonna keep perpetuating this cycle. It's gonna keep feeding you more and more of this stuff. And so again, I think what's helpful for me is knowing like, all right, I know this, right? This is my job, I do this for a living. I, I teach people about this stuff. I can't be perpetuating that cycle, right? Like that I, I think just knowing how this stuff works, I think for me, that, that, that's the most important part. You know, I think having the knowledge puts me in that position where to then engage with it would make me kind of a hypocrite, right? Like that I, 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 I don't want to be in that position, right? I want to be the person who's doing, practicing what they preach and doing the things that I know are effective and worthwhile. Yeah. As we've self-identified as non-worriers, I'm curious for those in our audience now who tend to be on the more worrying side, are there other characteristics non-worriers have that we might want to model or bring into our life if we find ourselves constantly worrying? And I think it's really instructive, right? Like to look to those folks who are not worrying. And I and I do want to, I don't want to pat myself on the back here too much, right? Like that I, I think in a lot of the ways that I don't worry, I think some of them I've gotten lucky, right? Like maybe that's genetics, but I don't know. But, you know, I don't mean to take credit for all of that. But I think I think there are still these things that we can look to that I think are really helpful and, and instructive there. Um, you know, you mentioned perfectionism before. And I so I think... <laughs> the absence of perfectionism, I, I think is a really important thing here, right? So like that willingness to kind of accept, and it's not mediocrity. We're not saying like accept doing a crappy job at something. We're saying be effective essentially, right? Like that we, we I, I think there's that idea of, you know, work hard versus work smart. And I think that's really all that we're saying here is that rather than doing as much as we possibly can, rather than trying to beat this problem to death, trying to figure it out, we're going to notice where it's effective and where it's not effective. And we're going to cut our losses. And it's going to be painful sometimes, but we're going to have to accept, hey, this isn't worthwhile anymore. Keep moving. Move on. So yeah, I, I think that ability to kind of embrace good enough, which doesn't mean you can't excel and do great things, but it means that you, you know where to draw that line. I think that's hugely important. I also think being compassionate with ourselves is a really important part of this. And just to kind of like connect those dots, let's say I take that, the big test on Friday and I bomb the test. If I'm sitting there saying like, oh, what a jerk you are. You suck at this. You're awful. You're never going to succeed, right? Like if I'm really mean to myself in that moment, I'm going to make everything harder, right? Like I'm not going to want to study. I'm going to give up. I'm going to say, oh, I'm no good. I, I'm never going to do well at this, right? Like that, that, critical approach, which I think a lot of people assume is going to help to drive them, it's going to hold them accountable. It doesn't really do that. You know, that when we're really mean to ourselves, when we're really critical in that way, we're actually making things a lot harder. And we end up in that place where we don't even try, we kind of give up. And so I, I think being compassionate, saying like, all right, yeah, you bombed the test. That doesn't make you a monster. It doesn't make you a horrible human being. Like, all right, you bombed a test. Like, that's that's okay. You messed up. You're human. It's fine. You can learn. You can grow. You can do better the next time. That ability to approach it with that kind of flexibility and compassion, I think, is really, really important. Where I, I would kind of connect this stuff with worrying is in saying, like, if I have that test coming up and I know that my worth as a human being is riding on that test... I'm going to get pretty stressed out about that, right? Like that that's going to start to drive worry. And so like, if I know, hey, if I'm on that test, I, it's going to be awful. I'm, I'm now going to just tear myself down in all these different ways. Then yeah, of course that's going to spur worrying, right? Like, of course we're going to get sucked into that. But I think if instead I know, hey, I have the test coming up. I really hope I do well. I'm going to work hard at it. But if I don't, okay, there'll be something to learn and I can try again. Then yeah, I'm going to be much less likely to get stuck in having to perfect it and having to kind of pour over it over and over again. I like to take the, the retrospective approach. So I can think very clearly in my mind around a few moments of panic stricken worry in college and grad school. And then with the business that, you know, zoom out a year, five years later and that negative thing that I worried about, one didn't come to fruition. And even in the case where it did, the one that I can recall, it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought. And it, I don't carry it to this day. 
And I think that ability to zoom out, and if you don't in the moment feel that ability around this one specific thing, to retrospectively look back at the practice MCAT that you bombed and you were freaking out about because you hadn't put in enough prep hours, or the midterm that you knew that you were going to fail going in and then you did, and guess what? You can't even remember the grade you got that semester on that English lit course that you had. You know, I think contextualizing and retrospecting a lot of those big panic-stricken worrying moments in your life can really help you as you have these come up again and again to turn the temperature down, to, to not allow them to overwhelm you in that important way. And I know in the past we've had episodes around habits and how people want to remove bad habits, but you can't just remove a habit. You can't just remove worry you have to replace it with something because it is an activity that that is self-soothing to you. It is something that your attention naturally gravitates to. And for some of us, it might be food. For some of us, it might be social media. For some of us, it might be worrying. And you can't just replace the, the snacky food with nothing. You can't just replace the social media with nothing. So what do you recommend our listeners replace worry with? Or what should they be looking at around some activities that they can engage with in place of the worrying? And again, I think this partly goes back to that thing we talked about before and saying like, hey, you have to figure out how it's functioning for you. So I, I like that idea of like, yeah, if worrying is kind of self-soothing. It's bringing you some comfort. Well, then, yeah, what else can you do, right? Like, yeah, can you change into sweatpants and watch a show that you really like? Or, right, yeah, can you go hang out with friends and feel some comfort there, right? Like that I I think you, yeah, have to figure out how it's functioning for you and then, yeah, tailor your approach accordingly. And yeah, it won't be the same for everyone, but it, it does require that kind of active assessment of, hey, like, what what is this doing for me right now? And how do I pivot to something that will be a better fit for me? And I for sure agree that, you know, I think that, kind of perspective taking is really important. And I, the one that I usually like to do is kind of the, hey, like what's going to end up on your tombstone? And I think, you know, Ben failed the calculus test, right? Like uh, nobody cares, right? Like it doesn't matter. Like that's not what's important. And I, I think it it's a really good way of putting some of this stuff in perspective that, hey, it sucks to fail the test. It sucks to, you know, lose a job or to mess up, to make big mistakes, to, you know, we, we are all going to screw up. But at the end of the day, I think these are usually not the important things. And I, that's not to say they're insignificant in the moment. Sometimes they have an impact. But I think when we get to the end of the day, certainly when we get to the end of our lives, these are not the things that really stand out. So yeah, I, I really like that perspective taking as a way to just kind of put it back in focus. I know one other strategy that we implement in our coaching program with our clients who have a lot of anxiety around socializing and connecting with people and maybe due to some past frustrations or lack of experience in that area or now in a totally new environment with, with people they feel less comfortable with is this concept of diffusion and recognizing that you can often fuse your entire identity to thoughts and emotions and unfortunately, that can be really difficult to break. And one of the strategies that we talk about is actually taking a step outside of yourself in that moment and talking to the five-year-old version of yourself going through that worry. Or, you know, maybe it's the college AJ going through that worry around the final. You know, how would you approach it speaking to that AJ, the 20-something AJ or the 18-year-old AJ versus, you know, the 42-year-old AJ and getting so wrapped up in it? and giving yourself an opportunity to diffuse from that emotion, that negative feeling that is associated with this event or this outcome that you really want. Yeah, I, I think diffusion is really important. And I think it, in a similar way where we were talking about kind of, hey, like you have to be aware of this stuff before you can do anything about it. Yeah, some people get really immersed in these experiences and they need something to help them to kind of take that step back. and. You know, that tracks, you know, that I think when we are experiencing more intense emotions, they're pretty consuming. You know, I think that's that's sort of just what our brains do if we're really mad or we're really scared, right? That we we get pretty in the moment about it, right? Like that we lose that sense of being able to kind of observe ourselves and, and step back from it. And so I think it's often a thing that we have to start doing really intentionally with exercises like, hey, like, what would you say to five-year-old you? Or, you know, that I, I think we need to pull back. And I, I 
I think for me, the simplest version of this is just a, a statement of like, hey, I, I notice I'm having the thought that whatever, right? So like that that shift from I'm a failure to I notice I'm having the thought that I'm a failure, right? It just, it puts it in this completely different context. And I think we can then notice it, we can observe it, we can choose how we respond to it, but it it doesn't have to be a thing that's just accepted as fact or reality, but it's just, it's an experience we're having. And we ultimately have a say in what we then do with that and how we respond to it. Um, but yeah, that, that prerequisite of, yeah, but you have to notice it and step back first is really important. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Ben. It was a beautiful place to to stop and give our audience lots to think about and hopefully some tools that our audience can use, especially those who find themselves in a, a worrying loop that can keep them from reaching their goals or living a life of their values. Where can our audience find out more about the work you do, Ben, and your book? Yeah, so my book is called Worrying is Optional. It is available on Amazon. It's also available through the publisher, which is New Harbinger. I'm sure they'd love for you to go there, but most people go to Amazon anyways, which is fine. (laughs) And then you can find out more about me. I have a website, which is www.bullcityanxiety. Bull City is uh, Durham, North Carolina, which is where I'm located. So yeah, bullcityanxiety.com. And then you can find me on social media and that's at Bull City Anxiety. Great. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. It was a pleasure. 